Welcome back, dear viewers. Um, we just had um, Brother Ibrahim Al Ansari um, talking and reciting um, the, the ziyara of Imam Al Ghazim. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, it's very refreshing. And something else, another topic that we're going to go into in this segment um, is something that's more of a social aspect that can affect us in different ways at different stages in our life as well. Um, the topic is addiction. And joining us this morning, as ever, um, is our wonderful sister Barak Hussain, um, who's from Canada. And and um, is a psychotherapist and you can find her on social media under the, the Muslim counsellor. So join me in welcoming Sister Barak Hussain. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Wa Alaikum As Salaam. How are you this morning? Alhamdulillah yourself. You look mashallah, very refreshed and you know ready for this topic. Inshallah. Um, enlightening Inshallah. Us. Um, so usually you would think about addictions and we and I will speak as a person as a lay person that you know perhaps alcohol, drugs, cigarettes come to mind um, and I don't know what the causes of these kind of addictions are, what prompts people to go down those routes, but perhaps you can give us a bit of background, um, what kind of cases you see, what addictions are sort of things that perhaps we don't always think about. Like I've given the top ones that I can think of at the top of my head, mm -hmm. but what, what do you see in your sort of career and you know, your professional life? It's true, when people think about addictions, the idea of alcohol and drugs come to mind. There's also gambling mm -hmm. and there's also pornography, so it doesn't necessarily mean just substance abuse. So the idea of an addiction is that you need a certain substance or you need a certain thing um, that will satisfy your need, okay, mm -hmm. uh, to, to fulfill mm -hmm. it. And so when initially, how does an addiction occur, and I hear this from my clients, for example, when it comes to uh, substance abuse, is they're at a party, they're at a get-together, and it could be both Muslim, non-Muslim, different mm. background people. And uh, it's a social situation where there's marijuana, and so they will smoke a joint, you know, just socially. And I, I heard one client say, I enjoyed it, so then I started doing it. Right. So then it became a routine and a habit, mm. and I cannot sleep without doing it, I cannot relax without doing it. And so the idea here is that in his mind, if I do not take this substance, I will not relax, I will not sleep. And so... It's the dependency the on de that. The dependency begins mm -hmm. because he said it became a habit, a routine. Yeah. So what happens here physiologically, <clears throat> excuse me, and at the chemical mm -hmm. level here in the body, um, you get the chemicals in your body which give you that release. You like that feeling. Mm -hmm. So you want more of it. Mm -hmm. You take more, it doesn't give you the same feeling, the same amount. So you take more, right? That doesn't give you the satisfaction more more so the hit gets higher and higher in order to to reach that demand and when it does it's never enough hence it becomes an addiction okay and it becomes more regular routine so it, regular it, habit like they then we, like you said it becomes a dependency they yeah. rely on that for that satisfying feeling but it's never enough so this is where you get yeah. into overdose this is where right. you get when we d talk about alcoholism it, it can be mm. destructive, mm. especially um, from a, a health perspective where yeah. you're destroying your liver with yeah. the alcohol, for example. So there's so many different levels to it, different types of drugs that some, you know, some would think uh, that, you know, smoking a joint once a week is harmless. But in fact, the THC levels of the chemicals that are into your body with that one joint is enough to trigger anxiety. One joint. Yeah. Anxiety, and so people take marijuana thinking that it's going to reduce their anxiety. If right. they take this is one joint, and yeah. it will trigger it. It'll stay in your body for a week. Wow! So one joint. Yeah. Imagine people who take it daily and multiple times a day. What is it doing to you? In your mind, you think it's relaxing you, but in fact, these chemicals stay in your body over such a long period of time, mm. and it becomes the triggering effect for anxiety. For example. Oh goodness! So it's almost like a double barrel. Exactly. Um, you know, you're not you. You the substance that you. Actually, take taking are is fueling what you're already yeah so fueling. what you're taking then becomes the trigger yeah because you need it to feel better but it actually chemically is making you feel worse so you mentioned different types of um addictions of substances um so alcohol drugs are oh, they quite common ones this is what of. we understand we understand and and may perhaps naively we think it doesn't happen in our community but we've had questions yes. of thick with our previous seasons where people, you know, perhaps spouses are concerned that the husband is drinking and, you know, do those actually exist in our community? Of course they, they do. do, they do. Yeah. Uh, just as in any community, we're not immune. No. I mean, we have boundaries and rules to help protect us, which is why 
uh, alcohol yeah. is forbidden for yeah. us, right? So people still engage in that behavior, but secretly. Mm. Some are, who you know, are far away from the religious community will publicly do it, yeah. um, but that's their choice in their lifestyle. Um, but people who ha are, are with the people who are living in a, an addictive situation will keep it hidden, right? right? And even like I said, in the non-Muslim communities, yeah. alcoholism is very prevalent. Yeah. And it, people try to pretend that they're functioning well while under the influence, while they're driving, while they're working, we know what can happen with yeah. the driving. Yeah. Because they, they show, they've yes. become so accustomed to the alcohol in their system, mm. they can, in their mind, they feel that they can function normally with it. Because for them, it's just like taking, um, you know, a painkiller to reduce mm. the effects of that. So people get addicted to it, starting off just as a social thing, yeah. and then it becomes a habit for them, and it becomes a dependency and they feel they cannot live without it. I've got lots of young people that come to mm. me of Muslim background as well, mm. who come seeking support and say, I don't want this to be part of my life. I know, you know, we've got the layer of the Islamic um, yeah. issues here that I know what I'm doing is haram. I don't feel that I'm worthy to pray or wear the hijab or go to a mosque because I'm doing these things. And so it's an added layer, an interesting mm. uh, discussion to have, you know, with the, with the, the student. The guilt as well. The guilt, the guilt and the is, shame, yeah. right? Because the, now it's become an illness, it's yeah. an addiction. It also impacts their, their yeah. life, academic life, yeah. their social life, the family life, especially if the family finds out. It's a, it's, it's it's a big a, deal. It's a spiral, downward spiral, isn't it? Exactly. And it's a shame because I, I, obviously when you speak to young people and they talk about perhaps, you know, I can't wear hijab, I can't go to the centre, I won't be welcomed, I have this. But actually, Allah is so merciful that he covers our sins. And even if we get to that point that we are doing things that we can't control, we perhaps need the help of experts like yourself to be able to learn how to control our mind, our willpower, and not succumb, succumb to haram. Um, but that we shouldn't alienate ourselves from a center because it could be that light enters us and shaitan plays with our mind, doesn't he? That, no, don't go because... Um, but yeah, we should never lose hope in God, I think is one of the you know, key Absolutely. elements. Absolutely, and, and he tells us he's the all-forgiving. And I use these yeah. uh, concepts in, yeah. in our therapy depending on the Who client is, and depending yeah. if they are yeah. wanting this yes. type of therapy. So it's very soothing and comforting yeah. when they hear that. You know, you repent, yeah. you do not repeat, yeah. you are forgiven. This is what we know. Yeah. And so that can be part of the therapy to help them along the way. It's, it's interesting what you said that, you know, the place where they could find that spiritual connection yeah. and redemption, they ban themselves yeah. because they feel they're not worthy. Yeah. So we work on that. We yeah. work on the worth. Now, I'm not a specialist in addictions. Yeah. Again, I do have connections in, the, in my community yeah. where I would refer students mm. because it's a specialized area. Yeah. And even here in London, again, I... I would recommend that people who are struggling with this to call the Muslim Youth Helpline okay. and they will direct them to the appropriate referrals here as well. Definitely, if I feel that, you know, people feel that they need the help. Um, you know, often, in, in what's interesting in, in considering what our previous mornings have been discussing different topics and the dependency that people, you know, it's, it's almost like the trigger, is it, is it stress? Is it something that we're not managing and then something gives us that temporary relief and that we're relying on that substance? Um, and in this case, we talk about di addictions. But yes. is that what's taking people away from normality and the stressful normality they have? Well, stress is, uh, it can kill you, as they say, if mm. you don't take care of yourself in so many different ways, mm. right? And just to backtrack a little bit when it comes to mental health and awareness and education, yeah. um, some people are predisposed, meaning they have genetic uh, hereditary factors in their right. family where yeah. they could be predisposed to certain illnesses, mental illnesses, just like physical illnesses, yeah. right? Like diabetes, cardiovascular, mm. high blood pressure, low mm. blood pressure, things like that, anemia, um, so some people could be predisposed to depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders. So it's there. However, there could be they could be living their lives normally, and yeah. nothing in particular is happening to mm. elicit or trigger their uh, illnesses. So they could be living for a long time, nothing right. happening to them. Everything's great in their lives, right. and then Subhanallah, suddenly like this, a certain stressor could come and trigger that, wow. right? And so this, this is also related to yeah. substances as well, or rather addictions, mm -hmm. where let's say they are uh, triggered by a certain stressor, 
and the comfort that they found, we talked about different mm -hmm. ways. We mm -hmm. talked about eating disorders. We talked about how people become socially isolated yeah. to deal and cope with these illnesses. Another, another direction people could take is through addictions, that a stressor could be triggered where they find that the best healing or coping is using substances or gambling or pornography to give them that relief. Um, in terms of the environment people are raised in, um, do, so say if you had a parent that was an alcoholic or was, um, was somebody that had depression, you s saw how they dealt with their stress levels and perhaps, you know, I mean, now we're talking about mental health has such an emphasis in society. It still needs a lot of work, but it's a lot better than it was, say, 30 years ago, that somebody's being raised in an environment that was very negative and very emotional driven. Um, would they pick up those sort of habits or is it something that we're capable of saying, no, that's not how I want to behave or should behave. Or can you actually develop those by mean, looking at behaviours that you're going to be copying as a... You mean like taking on addictive behaviours? Yeah. The, the problem here is how accessible drugs are, for example, mm. or how accessible gambling or access to pornography is. That's the issue these days. Yeah. It's not so much, oh, I am not going to be doing this. It's so easily accessible. Mm. It becomes you and your willpower and your choice to do it. I'll give you an example. A few years ago in Ottawa, we had a big conference. Uh, sorry, not Ottawa, Montreal. Uh, Sister Fatima Ali... Um, organized a conference on drugs in the community and we had big speakers like Hassan and Rajab Ali, um, Dr. Tim Sharp and Alvin Pal Palvin, if I remember the name correctly, who was an ex-football uh, player, football as an American football, not yeah, to British, yeah. <laughs> and he became highly successful in his sport but became highly addictive with his success right. to drugs right. and he crashed and failed and just lost everything and he came to share his story with us and he was an inspiring speaker and some of the, because he now has he's has a, is a reformed addict so mm. to speak a recovered mm. rather mm. addict and he gives talks and helps young people and families mm. and one of the statistics that he gave us which was very shuddering to think yeah. about and to parents who was and i remember the parents in the room they they could not believe it wow. He mm. said, children as young as eight, nine years old have access to drugs. Gosh. And when you think about it, well, how is that possible? Yeah. Well, let me tell you how, and he described it, and it's very frightening. He goes, when you leave them or they go to the bus stop, there could be some people yeah. around there of influence. When they're dropped off at the school, before they get into the school, that area, they could be, you know, Definitely the influences approach. could be there. Yeah. During the breaks, they could walk off uh, school property. There's some time there where they could do that, lunch as well. After school, when you're not home on their walk back or drive back home or from yeah. you know, the school bus, there's that time frame where they, and you think about it, you're like, wow, yeah. that, that's actually true. Yeah. So it's so important as families to have that discussion. You know, there's been huge campaigns over the years. I know, I remember growing up in Canada, just say no, yeah. no to drugs. Yeah. There's huge yeah. campaigns and you hear little lingo yeah. songs that play in your head. But there's so much to that because saying yes to it the first time could potentially that's all you need to get hooked especially if you have a an yeah. addictive nature where yeah. when you like something too much like we've got these fruits here you could be of an addictive nature where you love these clementines oh, one I, is not I, enough <laughs> let me say for an example yeah, right absolutely. you could sit and polish off eight yeah because you've got that addictive nature yeah. you enjoy you like you you don't stop so you could be of that nature and then you're exposed to this and then you just start and then the description that we did earlier yeah. about you know the hit is not enough that's how it can develop. Um, just quickly, we have run out of time, but I do want to touch on, so you talked about alcohol and drugs. I understand that, but how does pornography come into that? That there's just that, how does a hit get higher and higher and something like that? And it is happening. It's prevalent mm. within our communities in both men and women. These statistics come uh, from the Muslim Youth Health Line. We were discussing right. that the other day, yeah. and they've had more calls from young women as well. Right. And so there's a variety of causes. First and foremost, the lack of proper sexual education yeah. in our community. Um, people pulling kids out of programs that are already in schools, mm, for example, yeah. but they're not providing them with a the proper alternative. alternative. Yeah. That's huge. I know in our community it's ayib, it's shameful, it's taboo. Yeah. The reality is that's culture. Is Religion yeah. talks about this. There are books, there are scholars, our imams, the prophet, all talk about uh, sexual relations yeah. within a marriage in a healthy manner. But we don't talk about this openly with our kids. So what happens to the young boy or girl who become aware of their sexual desires? They're growing older, which is normal and natural. Mm. And we need to be aware of how to teach our kids about these things in a way where they don't deviate when they are feeling this and want to find release and relief. Yeah. 
because it's a natural human instinct, subhanAllah. Yes. So, and we are taught how to manage it in a healthy way. Mm. So they resort to finding out or learning about sexual education through what is easily accessible yeah. on the internet, on the phone. Yeah. So for example, even kids who, let's say, look at innocent YouTube videos of so cartoons and songs, yeah. you can see around YouTube and parental lack of parental control here, um, when you, yeah. know, you give the phone to your child, they can easily yeah. access all sorts of all things. Sorts. They could go to these by accident mm. and continue watching what is this, what is they become addicted again the process we discussed. Mm. So it could happen that way. I I see a lot of people who come to me and struggle with this. It's, Again, it's yeah. not a specialty of mine, no. but we talk about, all right, thank you for coming. Yeah. Bless you for coming. Especially Muslim students where they come and say, I know this is haram. But, I'm ashamed yeah. of this. I And th they're practicing Muslims in the sense that they're doing everything else, but they're struggling with this, and they don't want to do it. No. So uh, we're very blessed in our community that we have some young sheikhs who um, are very supportive. And so I, I would connect with the sheikhs and say, would you be open to talking to this? They want to work on it from a spiritual angle, while I connect them with the appropriate you know, yeah. sexual addiction uh, counselors that we have um, in our community. Fortunately, this is all we've got time for. I keep getting notified. Time's up. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's a topic in itself, isn't it? That Absolutely. I think something that I've learned um, really is speaking to you is that we can't really be in denial that these things, if they're happening in society, probably they're happening in our communities and not to think that We're faith immune. Can, yeah. We are not. We're not. We are human. Yeah. And we are, we can be easily susceptible to yeah. temptations. It's how we learn to manage them. The key thing here, sister, is to understand we have resources yeah. and it takes great courage. It's not shameful. It takes great yeah. courage to come and seek the yeah. support and help. And it's in a non-judgmental environment Definitely. as well. It's we so have either. the resources. Please access them. Definitely in the wise words from Sister Barak. Thank you so much um, you. again. And I pray that if anybody, if anyone is um, struggling, um, again, I, I gave um, some indication at the beginning of the show, there's the Muslim Youth Helpline. Youth Helpline. Please do approach the resources that are available and don't suffer alone. Um, again, inshallah, another morning, another chat. Um, and next up, we have um, Dr. Yasser Madani and another long talk. Pick.